Here we go. Welcome everyone. Um, this is our webinar Currings 101, 101 and we're having um, a sort of a uh, presentation live from the office with Kelly and Drew. They know everything about Currings and they're going to tell you everything and you want to know and feel free to ask as many questions as, as you want. Um, adding to the presentation that they prepared for us. That will answer a lot of your questions too, I think. So please everyone mute yourself. And if possible, if you know how it works, turn off your video. So our um, um, connection is as fast as possible. So I'll give the word to Drew and Kelly now. Welcome Drew and Kelly. Thank you, Liz. So I'm Kelly, I'm the director of operations. And, and I'm Drew, I'm the registrar. I'm the one who usually registers your polls and does transfers and all that jazz. So I know some of you. <laughs> so first we're gonna get started um, with kind of the timeline. A lot of people start calling the office early in the year asking when the curring tour is gonna be. So just to kind of give everybody an idea of what we do and how and when we're doing everything. Um, most of you all probably receive sometime at the end of late November and December, we send out um, a mailing with the membership renewals, which also includes a certain current survey. Um, I get a lot of questions of why lifetime members still get the membership renewal, and it's so that they still get the current survey as well. Um, we would love to get as many of those back as possible. It's a lot more important than I think people realize. Um, we really use those to determine which locations will have occurring um, where we have the most interest. So um, between December, January, and February, we're getting host applications in. Um, previous hosts will let us know that they're interested in hosting again. Um, usually in January to February, hopefully most years we get the dates that the judges are available to us. So then that lets me to get started on the current tour. And I usually contact the hosts that have sent in applications and shown interest and um, asking for blackout dates. Um, we research the major shows that might be conflicting with our tour. And then of course, I look at those current surveys to see where we have the most interest. And I basically set the tour. We're obviously, we're taking into account travel efficiency um, time changes, um, all of those things to try to make it most efficient for the judges so that they're not flying for hours and going back and forth. Um, so then once I have the tour set, I send it to the board of directors, the KWPN, our liaison, Hank Durston, and our jurors, and then they approve the tour or if they need some dates change. Um, but once I get their approval, I send it to the host and they approve the dates. They may have, if they forgot to give me a particular date that doesn't work for them. And sometimes there's last minute changes. Um, but once I have all that back from the host, that's when we get to announce it to the public, which usually we like to do it sometime in March. This year it was a little later. And then usually in late April, early May, that's when we announce that our occurring entries are open. I put the application up on the website. And um, at this point, I've entered all the classes into Equus, into the database, and online entries are open as well. Um, this year, we set the deadline, I believe, for uh, September, or no, August 31st. The first occurring date this year is September 16th. Um, we like to allow two to three weeks to cut off the baseline for current entries because there's a lot that we have to do from the time that we get the entry set to that first current. So having that timeline gives us time to order ribbons because we need to have a general idea of how many ribbons to order for each class. Um, assign bridal numbers. Hey, the current meeting is on. I'm sorry, what? Okay. Um, printing up score sheets, and then we send large boxes of supplies to each curring host. So that's, I just like to give people a reason of why we put that cutoff date when we do. There's just a lot to be done. And then I like to allow as much time as possible to make sure that those shipments get to the host because there, <laughs> there have been um, problems that arose there. So that's why we do it. We do accept late entries. 
with the permission of the host, if they're not full and they don't, if they have ample um, stabling. But I just like to let people know when they do have a late entry that it's very possible that they may not have a ribbon for them. They may not have a bridal, rib, uh, bridal number assigned to them and they may not have one of the pre-printed score sheets because those things a lot of times have already been shipped to the current host. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing to just prepare for the current tour and let you all understand why our times and, and, and dates of releasing everything it happens the way that it does. Are there any questions on that so far? Um, so next going on to curring host responsibilities, we are always looking for new curring hosts. We would love to have more locations and spread it out a lot more. As most of you probably see, we do have a strong um, grouping on the East Coast, but if you look at the curring surveys, that's, I mean, I, I literally go through each curring host and do, it's a very antiquated, very rough process. It's, it's a tally mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I literally write down a tally under each state or location of what's, who's willing to host to see how many horses are interested in that area. Um, so I communicate with the host starting early on, again, checking the planning process, availability, blackout dates. Um, Everybody, of course, would always love to have a weekend, but unfortunately that doesn't get to happen. Um, once the tour has been set and they've received it, I, um, and we've started getting entries in, I try to stay in communication with the host and send them preliminary list. Most of the time, I think they've probably been contacted by the people that are signing up for their currings and the hosts send out host packets with information on stabling, veterinary certificates that might be required. Um, sometimes lunch is provided, so they'll take lunch orders and those kind of things. Um, the hoster, I mean, they, they make our currents possible. Without them, we would not be able to do this. So that it's a lot of responsibility on them. It's a lot of financial cost on them. Um, if they're a breeder that has a lot of their own horses, yes, it may make more sense for them to host a curring. They don't have to ship large number of horses, but it's a big deal. And it is, it's not a small responsibility that they take on. And we're really grateful for all of our hosts. So at this point, for I don't know how many of you all have ever attended a curring, um, been familiar with one. It's amazing how many calls that we get um, question, I mean, it's probably right now, obviously this time of year, it's the majority of the calls that we're getting about um, questions about curring. So the first thing are what classes that are offered at the currings. We have young horse classes that is for foals, yearlings and two-year-olds. And one of the biggest questions that we get is, should I take my yearling or two-year-old to a curring? Um, I know in Holland, they don't, I don't think they even look at yearlings or two-year-olds. Over here, it might be different because there may not have been occurring close to you last year when you had a foal. So you may have a yearling that you really want some, their, the judge's opinion on and they weren't able to be seen as a foal. So we do allow yearlings and two-year-olds to be presented. They have their own separate classes and they're only put up against other yearlings, but they get first and second premiums only. There are no predicates that are allotted to any young horse, whether it's a foal yearling or two-year-old. We do have um, some monetary awards classes for foals, but we don't necessarily, we just this last year started that futurity where there was some monetary earnings for yearlings, but at this time we don't have any monetary classes for two-year-olds um, or monetary awards. Ellie. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, so if someone has a yearling or a two-year-old that hasn't been to a curing uh, because of COVID and hasn't mm -hmm. been put in a full book, the, will they still be put in a full book or not? Like if they go as a yearling or, or two-year-old now, will they be like in return, like be put in a full book, although they're already older because they've never been seen as a foal? So the full book is a book that you're actually born into depending on who your sire is. Um, for if you're not really familiar with our books, um, full books are going to be 
um, foals that are by approved KWPN stallions. Um, then our register A is for foals that are by our IRCAND or affiliate stallions, stallions that are approved with outside stud books, but that are full members with the WBFSH. And then our register B is usually by full book stallions that don't have any approvals anywhere. Um, so the horses are just born into those books and that doesn't change until you have a filly, which is this next class that we're getting to. At three years old, three years old, you'll take um, your mare for a stud book or star class. Geldings can be presented. They're not necessarily put into the stud book, but they are stud book quality and they can receive their star predicate. Um, and we've, we've got some other slides that we can explain the whole predicate system a little bit as well. Um, but, but for foals, their, their book is not going to change at a, as a foal yearling or two-year-old. All they're gonna get is a first or second premium and the judges have just their way of doing it. They give a confirmation and a movement score and it's a average, if you will, of those two. So if you get a 72 and a 70, you're gonna have a 71. You take the average of those two scores of your confirmation of movement. And that's, that's all that these young horses are scored on. They don't do the linear scoring on these young horses. Um, it's strictly confirmation of movement and first and second premium. There's no predicates. There's no moving into a book, anything at that age. But they can get a top five award or a top 10, ten award. So the foals, will have a separate top 10 award than the yearlings and the two-year-olds. So some people do think it's worth it to bring the yearlings and two-year-olds um, just for a chance to be in that top 10 in the nation as well. And also yeah. the futurity, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, some other classes that we offer at Currings. Um, so if you have a mayor that has previously been entered into the stud book, but she didn't quite meet the recommend or the um the requirements for star she can come back and do her stud book uh mayor reinspection for star um, and then there's also a class for horses who have come and done their star um gotten their star predicate for their current elite as well um, we offer a pre-advice class for two-year-old stallions you can also present three-year-old stallions as well um, this is a class for um, breeders who maybe have a colt that they think is really special, but they're not 100% sure if they want to present him for licensing. It's a great chance to get those colts in there, get them in the rings, let him be seen by the judges, and they can give you an honest opinion on whether they think that this, um, this colt is stallion material before you spend the money on the veterinary requirements and all that. Um, and then of course we do have the um, licensing classes for uh, stallions that are three-year-olds and older. And then we uh, offer four different types of performance classes. You've got your IBOP, which is the performance test that mares, stallions, geldings are all eligible for. Um, and any horse that's KWPN registered can do any of these performance classes. So even if you have a register B horse, that maybe isn't eligible for other predicates, it's still gonna be eligible for those performance-based predicates like the IBOP. Um, the DG Bar Cup is a performance class for dressage horses. It's just kind of a, a bonus class that you can do as well as your IBOP um, that comes with a monetary award if you get in a, you know, the top five, I think. Um, and, it's the same for the GES Cup for jumping horses as well. And we offer those classes up to eight years old. Um, the DG Bar Cup and the GES Cup are all offered up until eight-year-olds. Um, so you can bring your, your horses that are already under saddle for those. And then of course, for our, um, our harness horses, we have the Fine Harness Cup. That's always a super fun one to watch, um, especially the stallion classes. It's always really fun <laughs> to see a, a nice group of approved stallions in the ring at the same time. It's really special. So um, it's, you know, if you've never been to a curring and even if you don't have a horse to present, it is totally worth coming out and watching. You learn a ton, trust me. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a variety of classes that you can learn about and watch. Um, one thing, oh, go ahead. 
Uh, so question for register B, um, like a yearling, are they eligible to either be put into a different stud book or how does that work? I'm not really sure what they're able to be qualified for versus not. So register B yearlings, they can't get um, first or second premiums, but you can bring them for kind of like an oral evaluation. So the judges can still evaluate them just like they would evaluate any other yearling. They just wouldn't get an official score. So it would be kind of for your knowledge only type of thing. But of course, when they're older, you could bring them for any of those performance classes and they could still get their IBOP predicate if they pass an IBOP when they're three or older. But as a yearling, it's just kind of um, for your information only type of thing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I wanted to go back on the DG Bar Cup, um, it's based on their age. You have a three-year-old class or three-year-old test, a four-year-old test, five and six-year-old and seven and eight-year-olds. And obviously the requirements get a little more difficult the older they are. Um, and they're separated into those age groups as well for scoring and going up against each other. And they get a ribbon for sight Champions. champions and then the overall takes all of the top places for the entire curring tour and those are the ones that are the actual top dg bar cup winner and they they're the one i think it's five, the top five places over the entire entire curring tour get um blankets uh coolers with the kwpn and the dg bar logo on it and then the GES uh, stands for the Global Equine Sires Cup. They are, they're both G DG Bar and GES Cup are uh, like title sponsors for us. And the GES Cup is separated uh, that way as well. You have three and four year olds and they do free jumping, um, but then five and six and seven and eight year olds are under saddle. Um, that was actually added by Global Equine Sires. They wanted to expand that class and make it like basically give it a little more. They even up the award money. And I think they, they same thing as over the entire tour, the champions get uh, coolers and, and the monetary uh, award. Kelly, I have a couple questions in the chat. Okay. The first one is, is IBOP for three years old, three year olds only? No, okay. it starts at three years old. You can present them at any time. Um, we have actually had a 20 year old horse come and compete, uh, you know, try to get their IBOT predicate. So there's no limit to the age. There's just a minimum for the age. But there's also at a certain age, they need to perform at a certain level or not. Yes. So um, it's, I, I think the, so the three year old and then the four year old and then the five and six and seven and eight. But that's with the DG Bar Cup. Um, the IBOP kind of has two standard. parts. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a standard. The first part of the IBOP is kind of a standard test. It's the second part of the IBOP. The horses that are coming back for that DG Bar Cup, they're going to have maybe harder requirements the older that they are. And I would, I don't get too many of them, but anything over the seven and eight year olds is going to do the seven and eight year old requirements. Mm -hmm. um, it's not common, like she said, to get a 20 year old or even like a 10 to 11 year old, but it, it can be done. There's no restrictions for that. Um, okay. And uh, it would be for the DG Bar Cup because that's just seven and eight year olds. But for the IBOP, to get the IBOP predicate, there wouldn't be an age restriction for that. Okay. Uh, the second question Can you cover what is done in the IBOP level test for dressage <laughs> ages? Yeah, I think you kind of did that just now. Um, Maybe I don't have anything with me, like opened up right now and it's, ready it's to go, but I have, go ahead, it's Caitlin. Pretty similar, it's pretty similar to like first level, if I would could say, if you're going to compare it to dressage. And the three-year-old DG Bar Cup, like the part two is like training level, but you do have a lengthening of stride in the trot. And then four four-year-old is like first level, five and six year old is sort of you add in a little bit of lateral work and then the seven and eight year old test is more like third fourth level so it does it's go very experienced yes. on riding it so listen to her it does go up pretty significantly but you should make sure to make a point to know that to do the ibop you do need to do also the dg bar cup it's part of it mm -hmm. so the ibop is written individually by yourself in the arena and the dg bar cup is a group test so you'll be in with two horses except if you're a seven eight-year-old you'll do it by yourself right 
<laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, and she then, has to ride them all the time. So yeah, yeah. And Caitlin I knows her very she well. <laughs> um, also, um, another question: three-year-old gelding and only really wants a, br a branding done. What classes would he need to complete? Well, well there we go. <laughs> Can we handle this be. subject? Yeah, I don't want to. In the past, a gelding would have to get their star predicate in order to be branded. However, um, the KWPN in the Netherlands has requested that we no longer brand horses. Um, they have not branded horses in the Netherlands since 2000. And um, it's, it's a horse welfare thing over there. And so in order to kind of follow their policies as they're our mother organization, they have asked us to stop branding altogether. So unfortunately, brands will no longer be available. I'm very yeah. sorry. We will be putting a press release out for that. I'm just um, not looking forward to it. <laughs> but they did specifically request it of us and the board uh, agreed that we would comply with their wishes. Um, they, they have very serious laws in the Netherlands for horse welfare. And I guess they didn't realize we were still branding and um, they got a lot of, uh, push. they just asked us, they just asked us yeah. to stop. And so yeah. we agreed to comply with that. And I know we'll have a lot of disappointed members, but um, we didn't wanna push on that. So we will no longer be branding, unfortunately. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, <laughs> Kelly and Drew. Uh, the, the, the following question is, is the IBOP just a flat test? Yes. Well, for dressage it is. So the IBOPs um, are offered in every breeding direction. So a dressage horse is gonna have a separate IBOP than a jumping horse um, or a gelder's horse or a um, harness horse. So if you have a dressage horse, it would just be a dressage test. You wouldn't have to jump. Okay, thank you. That was it for the chat right now. Okay. And a lot of this stuff, um, I've been updating our current booklet um, and it'll, I'll be making sure that everything is most up to date on the website, um, the most up to date current booklet. I'm still working on it. There were a few changes and minor things and, uh, but that will be up on the website with the entire call sheets. Um, they didn't used to like to publish the call sheet for the DG, uh, the DG Bar Cup. Um, but they said now that it's okay to put that information out there. And so you'll have a little bit better idea of what to do going in. I strongly suggest, you know, reaching out to other people who have performed the IBOP um, or the DG bar, the GES cup, and it, you know, in any of our social media groups, um, I think people are willing to help you out on that, but that's probably one of the most important questions that we get. And all of that information will be available on the website. Caitlin, did you have something that you wanted to say? Well, she kind of just went over it, but okay. I think it, it's important for, like Kelly was saying, to talk to people who are experienced in it, because the thing that's different about it than like a normal dressage show is that you're not getting scored on how you're doing the movements. You're trying to show off the best potential of your horse. So it's really important that you speak to someone who's had experience with it and has done it because they can help you and give you tips on how you can show off your horse to so that it can get the best score that it that it deserves and that it needs. The only one that's the most like a dressage test is sort of the seven and eight year old one. But mm -hmm. even that is still just to show the potential of your horse the most. So it's not quite as strict as like a dressage test. So I think it's important for for people to be able to watch, like try to watch videos and see how people have done it before. So yeah, that's all. <laughs> Maybe we can, I know that there are videos out there of um, IBOPs. I know you found one because Drew actually watched an, a video of the IBOP and because the one that we had, it was kind of written in European standards with their lingo. And she rewrote it last year in like an Americanized version using the language that we use in our dressage test. Um, we even sent it over to Bart and had him approve it. So that, I think it's already on the website, but I'll make sure that it is. But I kind of named it the Americanized IBOP, but it's written in terms that we, our dressage riders would better understand over here. Um, any of you guys that have looked at that test before, the old way that it was written, it was- It was very confusing. It was really confusing. For somebody that's used to looking at it, uh, you know, a USCF, USCF dressage test, it was written kind of 
kind of funky, but um, there are a lot of really good um, videos on YouTube as well of like recent IBOPs done, you know, everywhere in the world. And um, I'd encourage you guys to take a look at those too, but absolutely reach out to people who have actually written them because obviously they can give you a lot more advice on it than than we can just from a, a standard standpoint. Yeah, so. and maybe we could get permission to put one or two on our website, on our YouTube page if whoever has those videos out there wouldn't mind sharing that with our page, um, try to have that on there because it probably would be really good to have watch that. Um, so the next uh, screen that we have is, um, this is a question that we get all the time. And Drew made this flow chart a few years ago. And I, I think it's, I, I understand it a lot, but I've, and familiar with it. I think it flows pretty well, but we'll just try to go through and explain it. It's basically taking a full book or a register a mayor to get her to cur or elite. And um, if, if most of y'all just really quick, we kind of went through it before. The full book mayors are typically by approved KWP and Stallion. It's the book that they're born into. And then register A are going to be mayors that are by stallions that are approved with other registries that are full members with the WBFSH. Or a licensed KWP and Stallion. Or a licensed KWP and Stallion. So when you start out there, um, you present them at, as three year old. You can do it when they're older, but the first time you can present them is at age three. And you would put them in the stud book star inspect inspection class. And um, I forget what the minimum score is for a mayor to go into the stud book, but they 50. 50? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So they get confirmation movement. A combination of the two needs to be 50. So stud book shouldn't be too hard to attain. Um, star just kind of means that they're a little bit above average. 65. 65. Um, and so that's going to be their confirmation and movement score combined for them to get their star predicate. And then um, when they, the mayors, if they get their star predicate, what they do at the inspection is they bring back the mayors that were given star and they have them come back separately um, from their regular first class and they compete again or just go around together. And that, that time the judges determine if they are cur eligible. Um, so your, but your basic predicates is you get stud book and then you get star predicate then there's the cur predicate, and then there's elite, which is, we're gonna go through each of these, but each one just is a little bit better than the previous. And so if a star mayor, and they, they look at all these star mayors together and they think that this one is just a little bit better, they're gonna say that that mayor is cur eligible. And for a register A mayor, this changed in 2018. They can now go into the stud book as well as receive their star predicate right away. Used to, they had to have x-rays and endoscopy. endoscopy to get into the stud book. But in 2018, the KWPN changed the rules that register A mares can get stud book and star right away. Um, so another big important question that we get all the time is what is the difference between register A and full book? And this is where that comes into play. So when a register A mare, if she is, get stud book and get star and is deemed cur eligible, in order for her to become cur, not only does she has to pass her IBOP or get her sport predicate, but she needs to do a series of eight x-rays called the DJD and navicular. I have those requirements there on the website. I apologize, I didn't put that into this um, PowerPoint, but- Most like, of it's medical jargon anyway. That right. Your vet would understand. <laughs> yeah. So these eight x-rays, the DJD and navicular. So the only real difference with full book and register A is when a mayor is star and deemed cur eligible, before that register A mayor could become cur, she would have to be able to pass this DJD and navicular test and get her sport predicate or IBOP, which is the, the sport predicate and the IBOP is the same for a full book mayor. Um, so once both of those have done that and they've become cur, once they've passed that IBOP or gotten their sport predicate and their cur, both a full book mayor and a register A mayor in order to become elite have to pass a DNA test called the DOC, which is a DNA test for the heritability of osteochondrosis. It's, um, it's you get two hair samples, they come into the office, the test itself is $250. 
We actually send them over to Holland. They do the testing and um, they have to get a particular score to pass that DOC. So once a mayor, whether it's the register A or full book, and they've done all of this, pass these tests, and that's how they reach that elite status. Um, a mayor that, um, let's say you have a mayor that's Oldenburg, Westphalen, Hanoverian, and you wanna present her to the Cato McGann for the stud book, you would treat her as a register A mayor. So she would also have to do those eight x-rays as well as the DOC. Um, that's really the only difference between a full book and uh, an Urkin registry or a register A mayor. There's not a whole lot of difference there. Questions? No? Nothing in the chat, no. Okay. Well, I did also want to mention too, I know it says it on here, but um, the, the veterinary tests um, can be done before or after the curing. It's totally up to you. Um, some people really like to have the judges announce that their mayor is elite right there. It's pretty cool um, in front of a bunch of people. Um, but if you don't care much about that or just haven't had a chance to get the veterinary requirements done, it can absolutely be done after the curing as well. Uh, there's the a DOC. question. Okay. Uh, I have a question. My mayor has her sport predicate and proc. What do I have to do to get her to elite? Is she already a Kerr mayor? Elizabeth Evans? Unsure. Okay. Okay. If, if she's been inspected and she's a Kerr mayor and she has her sport predicate and her proc, well, that just makes you already. It depends on if she's already been inspected before. So yeah. where we're going to need to start is going to depend on whether she's stud book sport proc or she's full book sport proc. It just kind of depends on, on where she is in the process. But for the ones, I mean, if those of that are new to us, um, proc, uh, the DOC has kind of replaced the proc. Um, but the harness horses and gelders. and gelders don't have enough population for the KWPN to determine a score. For the DOC, it is a genetic process that I could never understand, but they have a geneticist that does all of this. All I know is they get the right score. Um, but so harness and gelders, because they didn't have enough population to determine this DOC score, they still do the proc. Um, but for riding horses, um, they prefer the DOC. But if your mare already has her proc, if she got her proc before the rules changed yeah. in 2018, then the proc stands. Right. And um, so it really, for as far as your mayor, I mean, that she has her sport predicate, it's, it just basically is going to depend most on if she's been inspected and what that status was. Um, so if she's sport and has her proc, but she's never been inspected, then you would take her to an inspection. And I've seen people bring back, what was that one mayor that was, did? star for her oh um, i mean i, I mean they have old mares can go yeah it, like old mares can come whether it's just they're doing their stud book um or whether they're doing stud book for star or star for cur you know whatever her current inspection status is and if she's never been inspected then you would present her for stud book and star and then um if she were deemed cur eligible at that time she would elite. go straight to elite yeah, because she already has her sport. So then Correct. she would, yeah. And her proc. So yeah. she would be all set. Yep. So, and just kind of an off thing and things that have come up in past years. Um, when a mayor already has her star, our sport predicate, um, when they're doing the scoring for confirmation and movement, um, their confirmation score is going to be whatever it is. But Let's say you have a two mares, one has their sport predicate and one does not. And they both get an 80 on their confirmation. And then one gets an 82 for her movement score, but the other mare has her sport predicate. The sport predicate takes precedence, precedence yeah. over that movement score um, because sport is the ultimate goal. 
goal, my goal. right for for these horses and this this has happened and the sport predicate has ended up being a tiebreaker for us um and that's well just, it's just things that have come up over the years if you're presenting an older horse it's very handy to have that sport predicate if yes. she has those scores for sure yes <laughs> thank you kevin drew okay um so these are some slides i guess that the kwpn has put together recently and very nicely put them in english for us um i will put this uh presentation this PowerPoint up on the website because it's going to be a really good um, point of reference, I think, for people. Um, but it's kind of like we were doing with getting a, um, a full book and register a mare to elite. And this this slide um, basically goes through the process of, of getting the different predicates. So if you take a full book mare, to an inspection at minimum age of three, there is a height minimum. And for, I think stud book, it's a meter 58 and star it's a meter 60. Um, their minimum confirmation has to be 50. And um, so I guess one thing, since this is occurring 101, I, we didn't really just discuss it. And we do get this question for the stud book star class, um, what they're gonna do is they're gonna have the handler stand the mare up and they're gonna measure her on a flat surface and take her height. And then they have the mare walk away from them and towards them. And then they have them trot away from them and trot back to them. And that's all on a flat, hard surface. Like an FBI job, kind of. Right. And then um, <coughs> in the arena, which they have them set up like a diamond, I think it's a triangle. Tri like, like a triangle yeah. or with a diamond they have the force do free movement and they turn them loose. They have handlers in the ring um, directing them. If any of you all have ever watched the stallion show, um, it's very, very similar to that. And they have the horse jog, canter, do a figure eight so that they're changing leads and, and checking that horse's free movement. Um, so then for their movement score, they need to be greater or less than 50 points. Um, And if, if you have a mare that maybe is like an older brood mare that just hasn't been inspected yet, they do expect her to be sound in order yes. to get um, any Stud kind of or predicate. Something. Unless she has that sport predicate and she doesn't have to do the free movement, there she has to be sound. So yes. we get that question a lot as well. Yeah. Um, and so then the the acceptance into the stud book these these are the require minimum requirements for that. And then that's like her eligible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so then the star predicate or being deemed Kerr eligible, um, they reassess them in their confirmation of movement. Um, yeah, never mind. Um, so for the star predicate, it's a minimum height of a meter 60. Their confirmation has to be greater than or equal to 70. And then their movement for the walk, trot, canter, and posture has to be greater or equal to 75 points. Um, and then, oh, like we said, if the mayor already has her sport predicate, that sport predicate proceeds or takes precedence takes over, precedence. and she wouldn't have to do the free movement at that point. Yes. Uh, Kelly and Drew, there. Yes. Um, can we point out to the people what the, um, the meter heights are in hands for people that don't know that? I have I've... a handy dandy little thing that Kathy Hickerson put together for us. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. It. And it's also for the sports predicate we have on the website, we have a list of, you know, yeah. what set to be what set to means, you know, like third level, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So meter 58 is going to be about between 15.2 and 15.3. Um, and then meter 60, so the minimum height for star is going to be about 15.3. Um, yeah, Kathy put together these handy dandy little note cards. I think forever. she just made new ones too. <laughs> I would grateful reach that. out to her and ask her to send you one because they're wonderful. 
should send them with the um, membership renewals next year. There we go. <laughs> yeah, good one. But yeah, those are very handy. And um, there's there that the overview for the sports predicate is on the website. I can look it up, find the link, and then I can post it in the chat. Shall that I would do be that? Great. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll do that right now. Um. Yeah, the Z level for dressage is, um, it says third and fourth level. So I believe it's third level test two is the minimum for the sport predicate for us, uh, for dressage. Okay. Um, and then um, I think a lot of people get confused when it comes to star and cur. And I don't think like, and like it says here, um, there's really no score for Kerr eligible. And the way that it was explained to us, um, I've been to a few Kerrings. Um, probably a lot of you have been to a lot more Kerrings than I have been. Um, but when a mayor is given the star predicate, I think I kind of said that before, they bring the star mayors back together and determine, at, and they one thing that it specifically says in the, the rule book or the handbook is that they're assessed separately at that time. So it doesn't, they're not thinking back to what they did at their stud book star class. They're looking at when they've brought them back in, comparing them to the other star mayors and kind of seeing which one they think stands out more to determine whether or not those mayors become Kerr eligible. Um, and even if your mayor isn't deemed Kerr eligible at maybe her first, inspection you can always bring her back the next year and right. then try again um, yeah there's nothing to say that she won't mature or change or just be up against different horses and right. show differently that day so and i remember it was i think it was the 27 agm when bart did a um, clinic on linear scoring and he was talking about if if when they think a mare she needs more muscling in her neck or she needs to develop her hind end more um, those could be things that they point out to you at that time that you could work on um, over the next year. Again, so when you bring them back the following year, you're doing that either star for Kerr or stud book for star. You know, she did not get those at that time. We all know that these warm bloods take a little longer to develop and mature. And so maybe she just wasn't there at age three. And so, you, you know, bring her back. Everybody loves to get those higher mm -hmm. predicates. Um, so these, I'm gonna put these up on our website and they're on social media now. You may have seen them earlier, Liz posted them, um, but they're pretty, they're a really good baseline or um, reference for these predicates for each one. I'll go through each like, so this is dressage. Then the one for jumpers. Um, very similar. Very, very similar. It's just the difference in the scoring. They they look at jumping a little different. They look at scope and technique. They, um, they count less on the walk and the trot right. and more on the canter and the scope and the technique. So yes. just a little bit of a difference on the linear scoring in those disciplines. Um, but everything like just in the different breeding directions, it's kind of the same. And for the sport predicate in jumping, like if you were to bring a mare, maybe an older mare um, that can't jump anymore, you don't want her to jump anymore in order to get her sport predicate. So she would be exempt from uh, the IBOP. Um, she would have had to jump M level, which is uh, meter 20. So um, always helpful to send those results to the office beforehand. That way we can include those results in the judges books and they can actually see those as they're presenting the merits. Very helpful for them. Yeah, we put um, it's the jury book. And um, if you've got outside mayors that are being um, inspected, they, they want their pedigrees, they want their sport results. Sport results and I think even for KWPN mayors, they like to see all of that information. So um, include that when you send in your current entries. Um, the Gelders. Um, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, is jumping Sorry, portion for scoring done in a jump shoot or under saddle is a question. Well, it depends um, on the age. 
Right. Well, no, I think in the stud book star class, it's, it's all, it's all free, jumping. free jumping. Yeah. So it's, it's done as free jumping. Um, but if they're doing the IBOP, the IBOP is under saddle. Yeah. But for stud book star is strictly free jumping. <laughs> Excuse me, but the movement sport. But the Caitlin, Caitlin, what yeah, do you want to say? Yeah, I just want to say this is why when they do it, you always do the IBOPS test the first day or in the beginning right. of the touring because if your horse passes the IBOP in dressage <laughs> or jumping, then they do not have to do free movement, right. and they do exactly. Do yeah, yeah. Thank God, Caitlin. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Um, You're welcome. So. Um, the Gelder's That's horse is different though. Pretty so, much the same. Um, Gelder's is a very spe specific um, breeding direction. So they have some very specific things that they're looking for. Um, the biggest difference with getting uh, a Gelder's mare to elite is that they have to perform two separate IBOPs. Um, they're expected to do dressage and jump or dressage and harness or, uh, or jumping and harness. <laughs> But yeah, so those are the biggest differences. Um, I know Liz has worked very hard to bring awareness to the Gelder's breeding direction. We're thankful for that. We're getting a lot more interest in um, the Gelder's direction. So we're excited to see if any mares get into the Gelder's book this year. It'll be exciting. Very. Yeah, and also the Gelder's, the Gelder's is a little different because they have like some um, requirements for blood. For, yeah, pedigree uh, certain, yeah. yeah, pedigree requirements. So if you have a Gelder's horse or if you have like a horse that you think is in the Gelder's type, then you can send your pedigree to the office and Drew and Kelly will send it to the Netherlands to a special uh, assigned uh, inspector for the Gelder's book. And he will look at the um, confirmation and maybe movement if you have a good video and a picture he will send it yeah. to. And then he'll yeah, look at the bloodlines and he will give an advice if he thinks that the mare or gelding, but mostly it's about a mare, uh, can be presented as gelders at occurring. And it can also happen that um, you can still go to occurring and show the horse to the judges, but officially you should first have the pedigree proof. But it can also happen yeah, sometimes yeah. at occurring that the judges will think that a horse in type is very gelders and then they can put the horse in the gelders book if that has happened before, right, mm -hmm. Kelly and yeah. Drew? Yes, yep, yeah. it has. They are over overall more sturdy types. They're a little bit more, you know, they have a little bit more bone and substance than the other breeding directions that most yeah. of the time they have like yeah. more specific type. Yep. And they cannot have more than 25% hackney officially. Yes. But uh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, but if they do, and the, and the, and that's why it's good to send the pedigree to the Netherlands, the judges, uh, the inspector can still think it's a very typical horse or has specific bloodlines that are very good for the Gelder's breeding direction, which is officially a rare breed in the Netherlands. And then it can, he can still advise the owner to take it to the Curing as a Gelder's horse, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. She knows all about it. Yes, she does. We, we, we go to Liz girl. with our Gelder's questions. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> um, um, the harness horses are a little bit different. Um, they will get star, but they don't get her eligible. Um, they go basically if they are given their star predicate and then they pass. They're all cur eligible. They're, yeah, basically. they're basically all cur eligible. And then they pass their IBOB, the they're harness cur. IBOB, then they become cur. Um, they have to do the proc in order to get a lead. So correct. They don't have the option to do the DOC. Yeah. At this point. And Kelly and Drew, the, I have a question if, <clears throat> from someone if there's going to be specific part over uh, about the full inspection in this presentation. Like what's happened? What happens at a full inspection and everything? Oh, um, I can give you a little bit just of an idea. Um, they when they do foals usually i think when you get the they try to group um not necessarily in a class but if you have the ones that have the larger currings they try to have them go in in an order based on their age um and, and keep them as closely related in age so that you're not judging a two-month-old against a seven-month-old 
um, almost possible, not really. Um, but they'll go in and with their dams, with usually. their mothers, um, and they have a handler. They have they stand them up. They look at them um, from all sides. I think they have them walked back and forth towards them. And then a lot of times, some people think it's different, but they'll turn the mare loose and they and the baby, and they're doing free movement with that baby, and they go around the same type of. Um, arena as the mayor is doing for a stud book star class and and watch the baby go and each do a change and change directions and go back and forth a little bit of trot a little bit of canter um the handlers and the rings are usually very experienced in keeping the horses from getting out of control but but they're same thing they're getting a confirmation and a movement score and it's free movement and they're gone um they go around with their dam, but it's just one at a time. Well, they bring them all back in at the end under lead, with lead. Yeah, I'd be led. Yeah, I have they go in one at a time at first, and then after the whole group has gone, they'll bring them all in, kind of go over. Um, and that's when they need two handlers because they yeah. need a handler for the mayor and a handler for the foal. Um, what is the foal? What if the foal is already weaned or the mom is not available? That's okay. It's okay. Yeah, nope. we've we've had people bring them with a buddy. You know, if you think that a weanling's going to show better with their pasture mate, yeah, um, that's totally fine. They can come in by themselves. It's it's whatever you think is going to help that baby present itself the best. Yeah, so it's totally up to you. I have another question. Uh, will mm -hmm. there be handlers available? Because I can't run, and if so, are they included in the costs or not? So that's something you're going to have to kind of get in touch with your host site about. Um, they will have more information on handlers that will be available. It's not a cost that's included in um, the, the price of the class. You're going to have to pay those handlers separately. But um, I would reach out to the host site that you're interested in going to, and they can give you an idea if they have a handler lined up already. Handlers usually cost between 75 euros per horse and something around there, right? Yeah, 75 and 100 usually. It just mm -hmm. kind of depends on, on the person, how many yeah. horses there are. And yeah, so. But they're pros. It's worth they it. Are. They yeah, are. They're they, pros. Come, they know how to make those horses look nice. Yeah, it's <laughs> And they're really not worth af it. afraid of baby shenanigans. So. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're not afraid that. of any mm. shenanigans. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, I have another question. How does it work if you have a mare who hasn't been inspected and she has a foal at her side? Is that possible to bring them? Or can you just say it's just about the foal or can they be inspected both at the same time or? I don't think they'll inspect them at the same time. Yeah. They um, really want for a stud book inspection, they're really looking ideally for that mare to be in her best, in her best form. So right. um, usually that's not with Ideal. a foal by her side um and it would make it really complicated to do the the movement portion I unless so especially like a it. free jumping i don't know that you could even remotely do that i do know it a uh, judges have been known to pick out special mares and say <laughs> well we I like this her. one <laughs> um uh, yeah but it's usually not recommended it's not ideal but it does happen like I've it does happen. It happen i mean yeah. we were at the harness curring and this mare was doing her eye bop with her baby in the barn it was not fun <laughs> it's not ideal no. but in another they, they, let them, start with her. <laughs> they let them do um, it with the baby by her side but it's harder too for the judges to, it would to, be very the difficult. mare doesn't show as well usually she's not in her best form so yeah. it's up to you um and i'm sure that this might be more of a case this year because mayors got they were yeah, two they years were that they weren't able yeah. to be inspected they probably went ahead and bred them so i wouldn't be surprised if that's something that we deal with more yeah. this year than we have in the past um because you're going to have older mayors wanting to be seen you know that weren't able to be inspected at three or four um so I'd say it's just do the best you can, but I'm sure they it's won't not turn you away. Yeah, they won't turn no. you away. Let's put it that way. But it makes it more difficult. Yeah. I have another question. What is the benefit of a full inspection or can, or just wait until the filly is three year old? It really depends on your goals. I mean, 
if you have maybe a younger mare um, that you're wanting to get advice about what she's throwing, um, you know, get that evaluated. That's always beneficial. Um, if you have the foal for sale, it's a really nice opportunity to get something to its name, a first premium or a top 10 results. It's also a really good opportunity to get professional photos done. A lot of people use those photos for ads. Um, some people just like to bring them because they're proud of them and they want to show them off. So um, it's, it's more of a personal preference. Yeah. And, and like she said, what your goals are, um, having them for sale and having them get out there and be seen. A lot of times an inspection might be the only time that they, uh, that that foal gets to be put out if you're not taking them around to competitions or anything. But I think a lot of people like it for the marketing uh, benefit of it. And also, um, if your foal gets a first premium, that does count towards breeders points for breeder status. So, you know, if you're if you're looking to get into our um, breeders achievements program, uh, taking your your foal as yeah. as a young horse really helps with that as well, because you get one point for a first premium. So but only one point per foal as a young horse. Yeah. You don't get a point for when it was a foal and when it's a yearling and when it's But then and also also a second point for if it gets a top a top 10. So okay. So yeah. yes. And for the, when a foal goes to occurring, it's always nice for the mare too, because they can get preference when they have a good foal, right? Or not. Oh yeah. That's true. Because the mm -hmm. preference if they have three or more offspring. Well, that's star right? It's it's for um mares that have a little bit older no, it's offspring. Star. It's yeah. yeah, it's star, yeah. but um it's a it's it's, it's fun good to see all those yeah it's good out. advertising and mm -hmm. also for the for the stallion if if they go into the, if they enter into the futurity. Yes. And one thing I probably should have put it into the PowerPoint, I might add it in, I didn't really think about it, but the criteria and the awards program for the Iron Spring Farm Curring Awards, um, that is monetary awards that we give to the top champion and reserve foal, three-year-old um, mares and geldings, and I think even something else but the um I apologize for not putting it in there and I apologize it's been two years since I've done them I can't remember the exact um winnings but Iron Spring has been uh, sponsoring this curring award program for quite a few years and um it's a it's a pretty good um amount of, of money that they give and it's given for it's given to the breeder and the owner yeah, as well. So split between them. Yeah. So um, but I think I know it's just foals and then three-year-old <laughs> mares, geldings, stallions. I shouldn't have brought it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll I'll put something out in an e-blast about it. I'm sorry. There's there's several uh, chances to to win money. Yeah, and especially now foals. last year was the first year we had the Foal and yearling futurity that will be continuing this year will be allotting even more money since we did so well with the stallion service auction. Um, and um, that will be for foals and yearlings. So um, if you anybody watched those the videos last year and saw that this year it would be based on actual occurring scores rather than the videos. And so we're pretty excited about that. So no extra work involved this year. Right. <laughs> Just a form. <laughs> Just to get it. to the curry. Any other questions? Not right now. Not right I now. I posted the link to the Breeder Awards page on the chat. Thank you. Um, so this is a very common question that we, we get as well. Everybody wants to know how to take a colt or a stallion for licensing. Um, this is another flowchart that Drew put together for us. And she does. Um, <laughs> And the first thing, the KWPN ex extended the date for getting pedigree approval. And so now that cutoff date is June 1st. So we still have time for anybody to get their pedigrees in. And I think if anybody's watched the stallion show for the last two years, you really see where they're looking very strongly at the mare lines and the performance of the mares and the mares entire dam line. So we don't really have an official form for pedigree approval. I get that question a lot. I probably should come up with something, but 
basically you call the office, you tell them you want to present your Colt for or your stallion for licensing. Um, we'll tell you at the time that if you have any supporting documentation for your dam line, um, especially any, if it's a North American dam line, yeah, they're not going to have They're not going to be familiar with it. Um, any sport results the mayor has done herself, if she has siblings, other offspring that have done um, exceptionally well in sport, they really like to see that information. Um, so just any supporting documentation you can for the dam line, obviously the sires, they're probably going to be fairly familiar with. Um, they take a little bit of time to get back to us on yes or no, but um, once you get that pedigree approval in, which is required, it is required I and it's required every year. The, this will be the only exception is that they did tell us for if you had a pedigree approved the last year, that they will accept it for this year. Uh, since we didn't have the currings last year. Um, but you cannot bring your stallion to the curring for licensing if the pedigree has not been looked at. Right. Not necessarily proved, but looked at. So, yes. So, as you'll see in here, you present it. I know. Yes. <laughs> but um, we're having a computer battery issue here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you'll get your pedigree approval and get yay or nay on that. Um, we we'll put over here, if they say no, you can either put the pedigree forth the following year um, and try again. Or if you really feel that your stallion is exceptional, you could still bring it. But basically what they've told us is it has to be truly exceptional to overcome what they felt was not um, an outstanding pedigree. Um, if the pedigree is approved, um, when it comes time for the curring, you present your colt or stallion in the full approval class. Um, it's kind of like the stud book and star class for a mayor. They're going to measure the stallion. They're going to watch him yes, um, do uh, in hand um, and, um, and free movement and jumping. They're going to want him to do free jumping as well. And then, um, sorry, just making sure the computer. There we go. Um, and then in, a, in the licensing, so they'll do free movement confirmation. Um, they will do have to do the IBOP and pass the performance test. Um, and if they accept all of that and they pass that, if you have not done the vet work before, you have 30 days from the end of the curring tour to um, submit all veterinary requirements, which are gonna be the endoscopy the navicular DJD, as well as the DOC, and a semen evaluation. Um, if those are passed, um, the stallion will be, I think they go back and they still discuss the stallion with the stallion committee in Holland, but share their notes and thoughts. And then the stallion is considered licensed with KWPNNA and their offspring are eligible for register A book. Um, if they, are not passed um, and you wanted to try again the next year, you would do the pedigree approval. Your veterinary test would still stand. Once you pass the veterinary test, that's that. That's you, for life. That's for life. Um, but you would represent them the following year. And if your stallion is a little bit older, um, let's say you have like a seven or eight year old stallion that you're just now wanting to bring, they are going to expect that that stallion's been competing in sport. So don't be shocked if they ask for um, sport results. Um, they, those older, what they consider older stallions, they're really gonna wanna make sure that they've been competing. Yeah. And ideally they would have offspring on the ground that you could bring yes. as well, but sometimes that's not the case, so. Yeah, so obviously a three-year-old is not typically going to have offspring on the ground, but we have had older stallions presented. And I think the fact that they had foals there at the inspe inspection being looked at was, kind of a, a benefit to them. Messenger um, in particular. Right. Remember, there was one in Canada that had five or six foals at the curring that he was being licensed at. And I think that really helped helped his helped his case and he yeah. actually got licensed. So I have a question. Uh, wouldn't it make yeah. sense to do the DOC before the stallion is presented at a curring? Yeah, absolutely. Any of these tests can be done before the stallion is presented. Um, a lot of people prefer to do that before they get a stallion. Mm -hmm 
in Detroit. It, it actually class. used to be that it, they were required before. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it was till like 2018 that um, we option. were able to get it passed to where they could take 30 days to get the test submitted because um, it, it was kind of maybe a little bit of which came first, the chicken or the egg, if you spent the money to do the veterinary test, but then they didn't like them at the occurring or um, that, or they put the know, time and training, put in, the time and training and didn't in, pass. didn't pass. So, um, but you only have 30 days yes. um, after the occurring, which seems like a long time, but when you have so many requirements and have to coordinate getting into the vet hospital and yeah. stuff, it's not that long. No. So any that you can get done beforehand um, is definitely encouraged for sure. Yeah, because some people feel if you're not going to pass one of the veterinary tests, then you're saving a, a little bit of money presenting the stallion at the curring. But again, there were people who felt like they didn't want to put the money in on the te veterinary test if they weren't going to be accepted at the curring. So again, it's it's kind of, I mean, it's personal preference. It really is. Um, I but, have another uh, question. Yep. It says, is the PROC exam necessary? Only for harness stallions and gelder stallions. Um, they, they, they have decided that the DJD and navicular combined with the DOC, I think it kind of outweighs the PROC. Um, unless the stallion does not have um, a pedigree that they can do the DOC, um, they're, they're gonna prefer the DJD and navicular with the DOC. Um, the PROC would not count unless the committee says that they can't um, do the DOC, do the DOC because of their relation to the population. The PROC is not going to count towards um, stallion. They put, so. I think they put more emphasis and importance on that DOC now. Um, but there are genetic. people who still choose to do the PROC for that predicate because the PROC actually does get you a a predicate. So Whereas if your DJD just, navicular does not, the DOC it, does, but the DJD. So if you're just looking to get your horse as many predicates as possible, you can definitely still pull the proc because those uh, navicular and DJD um, x-rays are going to be in or there's proc views. Yeah. So. What is the fee for pedigree assessment? There is no fee. No. Nope. You just send it to me with any supporting documentation about the mare line, and I put them on a list to send to Holland. We send them um, usually in a couple of big batches, and um, then they let us know as soon as they can whether the stallion has negative advice or positive advice. And just because your stallion, you know, doesn't technically pass pedigree approval, it doesn't mean that they can't come to the curring. It just means that he's going to have to be very impressive. <laughs> Yeah, because they uh, the the pedigree with all the extra information about the mare line goes to the stallion official stallion committee of the KWN, right? Yes, Correct. we yes. have nothing to do with it here in the office. We just gather the information and send it on to the people who are trained to do this for a living. So <laughs> yep. <laughs> these are the people that are evaluating the stallions in the Netherlands. It's the same people. Yep. And what is a good approach for a stallion that is slow maturing? Like, would you advise to have to wait another year, like, and present them when he's four? Or uh, again, that's kind of personal preference. You could always bring him for the advice curring. Um, you know, even if he's a little, you feel like he's a little bit immature or not ready for an IBOP or what have you. You can bring him for the the pre advice um, to kind of just see if the uh, the jury would be even interested in him. And they may tell you, yes, bring him back when he's a little bit more mature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, that that advice class is really underrated, yeah. especially for stallions um, that are, are being a little slow to mature, especially some of these jumper stallions that mm -hmm. maybe just can't pass the IBOP quite yet. It's a really great option to get um, opinions and, and they will give you a um, very yeah, honest opinion. opinion about what what they think and you can start doing these veterinary requirements at two and yeah three I think months you can do uh, april of their two-year-old april year. of their two-year-old year so you can pull the x-rays yeah. and we usually tell people if it's you know if you have a register a mare or a stallion that you think you're going to want to um present i would get those x-rays done as early as possible before they start training before they start having wear and tear on their joints um the test itself is $150. Um, you do have the cost of the x-rays, obviously. Um, 
the x-rays are submitted to us, we send them on over to Holland and um, that doesn't actually take too terribly long. They mm -hmm. seem to get no. those back. The DOC test, I will. That takes about six to eight weeks. It is absolutely so. every bit of six to eight weeks. Um, sometimes the tests fail. They've had to ask for second. And that's why we ask for two baggies of hair because um, they've requested that we send two samples of hair over. They've had the test fail before and we've even had to have people hair in again that we send over to Holland because sometimes the test fails. Um, not that the horse fails the test, but the test itself doesn't work for whatever reason. Um, but um, the DOC test is $250 um, and kind of cuts out those Fourteen, fourteen extra X-rays. Sorry, um, math is hard. Yes, <laughs> so um, I, I think it's they're not they're not horribly expensive tests. Um, kind of reasonably priced, I think. Um, we when we get DOC tests here, we'll we might send on them a week or two weeks. We try to accumulate as many as we can because we ship them over to Holland and. Um, we do have, it's not an expedited test, but you can pay for the shipping yourself and have your sample sit on over. Um, otherwise it might sit here for a couple weeks until we get some more samples in to kind of make the shipment worthwhile. Okay, it's Andrew, to get lost. I have yeah. a question uh, again, where it says that the advice class is on the no side of the chart. It's in the middle after you say submit pedigree proof for before June 1st and then accept it no. And then it says on the right, present for advice licensing class occurring if you feel stunning can overcome his pedigree performance. But you can also send, you know, present them for advice occurring if his pedigree was accepted, right? Oh, and absolutely. Then, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the advice occurring still does require that you send that pedigree in to be approved, even if it's a two year old just going for advice. Yeah. Um, but what, what I was meaning by that is that even if the pedigree isn't approved that year, if you still feel that your stallion is of exceptional quality and you want to present him, you can still present him for that advice class or the licensing class. He would just have to be incredibly exceptional to overcome whatever they feel that he's lacking in the pedigree. So. And it says, what is the chance of a stallion being approved if they are out of a thoroughbred? That's up to the, that's up to the jury. I mean, especially if, you know, if the thoroughbred dam line has exceptional sport results then um i mean we can't say of course because we're we're not the ones <laughs> evaluating the pedigrees but there's nothing saying you can't submit the the pedigree and see what they say it's 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 free I mean, there to have been approved thoroughbred stallions um they're not the ones that were probably on the racetrack they're ones that competed in sport but um it's, and there's one Eric Kent too, I believe, because of mm -hmm. his sports results, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. There's nothing saying that um, a stallion out of a thoroughbred mare can't be presented. So uh, definitely submit his pedigree and we'll see what they say. Yep. Just give it a try. And right. is it a good strategy when you have like a two year old has pedigree approved first to go to the advice current as a two year old and then decide if you send in a pedigree again at, when he's three? Yeah especially, yeah, especially if you're on the fence either about selling him or gelding him, um, that advice class is usually really helpful to de determine those decisions. Um, yeah. it's, it's a pretty easy class. They just want to see him in, in hand and mm -hmm. a little bit of free movement. Um, he doesn't have to do any sport requirements. So they are gonna measure him though, right? they'll still measure him. Um, but it's, it's just a really good chance to see kind of what the jury thinks about that. Um, uh, before you spend the money, you know, to do the full licensing and all the training and all that. So I have another question. It says, when you get the advice back, is it just yes or no? Or do they give a reasoning behind their rejection, for example, if they don't like it? So they used to give a pretty extensive um, reasoning as to whether they say yes or no. Uh, um, the problem with that was that we were getting these pedigrees back very very late um, because they were spending so much time, you know, they were spending a lot of quality time sitting down and really looking at every every part of this pedigree. Um, and while we appreciated that, and so did the owners, 
it was difficult to get the pedigree approvals back in time to get um, signed up for the current right however if you have specific questions you know if whether the stallion is um has positive or negative advice on his pedigree you can always ask us for clarification and we can ask them that's that's not a problem i'm sure they take lots of notes when they're yeah when they're uh, looking at these pedigrees so um at first you won't get a whole lot of information um, but if you want more information we can certainly ask them i send in a pedigree approval for my young colt and they said interesting better be or something and yeah they yeah that's it, about as in you know? depth as they go yeah 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 but you can always ask for clarification because our liaison is always pretty good at you know like asking yes. for mm -hmm. he's a, he can always give us a lot of uh explanations right so yes yeah i had a question about a, a specific stallion that i needed the answer to you know right away and hank was very good about getting back yeah. to me in a timely manner with a good explanation mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay. I think that's it for the chat right now. Okay. Um, I wanted to just throw this in here. I don't know if we have many harness horse owners on the call, um, but um, a, a, mm. harness horses are a little bit different yeah. than um, right. riding type horses. So, uh, a full book or a register a mare for riding type can go to a curry and get evaluated for stud book um, because they're trying to open up the breeding population a little bit with these harness horses and reduce the line breeding and inbreeding they do open up the stud book class to register b mares as well um but they in do the harness have, breeding direction yeah, only only in the harness breeding direction um, but they do have a couple of different requirements than you would find in just like a normal stud book class yeah so a registered bee mare in the harness breeding direction um, can potentially get into the stud book but she would need to be presented at the curring um ha be have high enough scores to get into the stud book as well as get um the star predicate and pass her um i bop but if she uh she would have to get an endoscopy um, the proc, again, because they don't have the DOC option for the harness horses, um, and past her IBOB, a register B harness mare can get into the stud book. Um, and it has to be a harness IBOB, unfortunately. Correct. It does have to be the harness IBOB. We're getting a lot of harness horses competing in dressage anymore, and um, but in order for them to to become a cur mare, they still have to produce, uh, perform a harness IBOP. Um, but I just thought it would be nice to put this into here just because we do have quite a few harness mares out there, but but it is at a harness curring um, only or they have to be judged as a harness horse, um, but they can get put into the stud book. It's uh but they can um, you know if you if you have a harness mare that uh, you're training in dressage or jumping they even though they won't be able to become, you know, a cur or elite mare in the harness direction, um, they still can get their sport predicate in dressage, jumping, eventing, hunters, any of that. They can get um, their sport predicate in any direction. Yeah. So, uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. If you have a foal showing in the tour and the sire of that foal is approved and licensed, does anything change for the foal? Would the stud book listing change from foal book or? to a for the full so are you talking about like if a if a stallion hasn't been approved yet and he gets approved like on that same yeah. tour i think josie you mean if um if it has uh, the full has register a can it go to full book when after the stallion gets licensed because full book is is a, a foal doesn't get into foal book unless the stallion is licensed or a fully approved, approved right? Yeah. So right. foal book is like the the best paper, the top, right? Yeah. right. The top. So it it will not go to register A from foal book because that's what no. she asked. What oh, okay, she asked. no. But but one thing that's not always known is if you have a a foal by a stallion that was not licensed um was a full book stallion or something and and you get b papers 
Yeah. Um, if and when that stallion attains approval, whether it's KWPN or another registry, their papers will move up. Um, I go back to Messenger all the time just because he's the perfect example of this. Right. They, they registered a bunch of his foals in, in Register B before they presented him. They presented him for licensing. He attained KWPN NA licensing and all of those foals moved up to Register A. So now all those foals, all those fillies are now eligible to be inspected for stud book. Even though they started technically as a Register B, they moved up because their, their sire status moved up. Yeah. So. Does that go automatically or does do the owners have to do something for that? We try to do it automatically. Um, we'll try to catch it. Yeah. yeah. But there, I mean, if you always have a question, please yeah, just tell me. <laughs> but, we, we may not catch all of them, but if we learn of a stallion's new approval, um, it's one that we might be familiar with, whether he's KWPN or whatever. If we know that this horse has attained new status, um, of approval, then we would go in and look at his foals and make the appropriate adjustments. And foals then you'll just upgraded. send the papers. Yeah, foals can be upgraded, but they can never be downgraded. So yeah. if for some reason a stallion loses his status, gets put on a watch list or loses his licensing with the Urkin registry that he was with, um, your foal is not going to downgrade. The papers won't go back. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. Are there any mayor requirements for full registration? No, so we're kind of um, unique in that way. We do not require mare inspection in order to register her offspring. It's totally optional. Most mares are eligible for inspection if one is um, convenient to you, but it is not a requirement. And back to stallion licensing, does the pedigree assessment take into account the overall population genetics in the KWPN? For example, if your stallion candidate has a famous full brother who is an approved stallion, does that make your stallion less likely to get pedigree approval? It really depends on what they kind of feel at the time, which is why these um, pedigree approvals are annual. They're not for life um, because they're looking at the data from that, that year, year and in recent years. Um, I wouldn't say it would count against him, especially if that stallion's in North America and the other ones in, in Holland. Um, if anything, I think it would probably make him look better. Um, but you know, that's something kind of for the stallion committee just to decide in that year. They always take into account what stallions are available. If there's too much of this type of blood and not enough of this type of blood, they, they take that all into account when they're evaluating those pedigrees. And that the mare line needs to be good, that's a given. That doesn't yes. change. They'll they'll look right. the same at that every year, right? Like yeah. it just needs to yeah, come from a absolutely. predicate rich dam line with a lot of sports and stuff in the line. Yes, yes. Um, and also, do you think that the KLPN Stowing Committee looks at the population in North America separate from the population in Europe? I think they probably try as best yeah, they can. Best they can. Um, we don't have that knowledge as readily available to them as they might over there. You know, they, because they'll ask us questions about a certain horse's sport results because they don't have easy the database. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and we, um, we pull sport results for them all the time. Um, I was just talking to Hank about a stallion that wanted to be um, put in the hunter direction. And of course, they don't know a whole lot about hunters over there. So he was asking me some additional information. So they really try to go as much in depth as they possibly can. Sometimes they just need a little bit of um, Sherlock Holmes help over here to get all the information. Yeah, so to back to the question, it could be possible if the stallion has a famous brother, but that one is in Europe that they think yeah. it's still interesting to have him oh, licensed yeah. because he's here. For right. sure because those bloodlines might not be available to us. Absolutely. But, exactly. but you don't yeah. know, you can, you could just have to enter it. Right? It's, it's really, I mean, yeah, we're not on the committee, so we don't nope. know exactly what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, but again, that's why they do it yearly because they're looking for something a little bit different every year. Yeah. Okay. No more questions in the chat guys. Okay. Um, so that's basically, all I have for the basic presentation, you guys have asked a lot of really good questions along the way. If anybody has any extra questions, 
we're happy to answer them right now. Um, and what is it re been... with recipient bears? I had, I had a question in my personal chat about that. Mm -hmm. um, recipient mares can come with the, the foals to the inspection. Um, we have a breeder up in Canada who uses a ton of recipient mares. Um, they're always presented just in a plain leather halter along with the foal. Um, that, that won't affect the foal um, at all. So you can choose to, you know, she obviously is not the one being evaluated. So it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I have another Oh, sorry. I will say just to put it out there because we get this question a lot. Um, we don't do anything with the recipient mare's DNA. Um, when we're DNA parentage verifying a foal, we're going to do to the biological dam, not the recipient dam. We actually get that question quite a bit. They're, they used to ask for the recipient dam DNA just in case for some oh, odd yeah. reason. It didn't match, but that's so rare. We, we Very. don't bother anymore. And uh, what is uh, the question is, is the Stellin Sport test replacing the 21 day test? Um, we are still ironing out the full approval with the Stallion Sport test. Um, I think that will be another webinar for another day when um, I will say that our judges are coming over for the Stallion Sport test this year. For those of you who don't know, it's the North American Stallion Sport test. That's yes, there's um, one at Polly Rich Farm. There's one um, at Hilltop Farm and several registries participate. Um, and it's just a chance for a bunch of stallions to be seen by a bunch of registries all at once. So. Yes. And so um, if you guys noticed with the stat the current tour this year, um, you've got Hank and Ari coming September 16th through September 29th. And then they go home. And then Hank Dirksen and Floor. I can't remember. Okay. Floor. Yeah, that. Well, yeah, that. <laughs> they're coming back October 5th and they're going to be doing um, a Southern California curring, the DG Bar curring, and then they'll be at the North American Stallion Sport Test. Um, they'll be on the West Coast and then they'll be going to the East Coast, a hilltop, and then the Iron Spring curring closes up the tour this year, um, I think on the 15th of October. So top tens will be a little later. So as soon as that Sonnenberg curring is over September 29th, the tour is not officially over until we have uh, the DG bar and Iron Spring curring. And um, so people are going to have to wait longer than usual for the top tens this year, but we'll do the best we can as soon as the tour is completely over. Um, uh, but it will be interesting. Like I said, I, I don't want to finalize anything with um, Full stallion approval, but but Hank and Floor will be at the North American Stallion Sport Test, kind of getting an idea of the, um, the of how it works, the format. Um, I know Willie is really excited about it. He's very been very impressed with it, and he's um, was a big help in in getting the KWPN to agree to come and participate in the NASST. And um, we'll see how. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes this year, and I'm looking forward to it. So we want the answers just as much yes, as you do. Yes, we do. <laughs> we will get them to you as soon as we have them. Um, I think this year is just going to be kind of a little bit of a testing the waters type of situation um, to see how it works, how they feel about it. And then after that, I think they'll be able to give a much more solid answer as to how they want to treat it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Um, is the KLPN considering additional genetic testing options to add to DOC? Not that Not I know, that know of. of. Is there one in particular that you were looking for? Well, I placed an article on the on the Facebook page this week about the interview with one of the Dutch breeders that said that should there should be more genetic tests developed for other traits, but there is not nothing announced about that yet. Right. But there are discussions going on in Netherlands about it. I know that. Okay. Yeah. But there's nothing officially announced. No. Another question, just clarifying cost for full inspection. Is this dependent on the host? The site for the event I would like is not live for me to check. Um, so are, can the cost so, I mean, defer the, the, per host? Not really. So the, the fee that you'll pay for the actual full inspection 
is just one base fee. So it's $75. What's going to vary is um, any additional costs like stabling that and is handling. determined by the host. Yeah. So um, that's something that we don't control, but you'll never pay, you know, this year, you're not going to pay more than $75 for your actual full inspection. Right. Thank you so much. With register B mares, are they only eligible to go for IBOP or are they able to receive any other status? So um, a register B riding type mare, so a dressage hunter jumper mare um, is not gonna be able to receive star, cur or elite. Um, she is allowed to come and be evaluated kind of like those register B foals that we talked about earlier. For um, um, oral evaluation. And, Right. If you're looking for advice on who to brief her to, what what she needs to improve on, you can still bring her, get that oral evaluation, just like they would give any other mayor. Um, she just won't be in the running for any of those predicates. Um, she can participate in the IBOP and get her IBOP predicate. She can participate in the GES Cup, the DG Bar Cup, anything like that. Um, that's that's not a problem and she would still be eligible down the line if she had a bunch of really fancy babies she could be eligible for a preference for study as well yep because if her offspring does really well in sport then she can still earn a prestasi mm -hmm. predicate right absolutely if they're all registered with the k yeah right right okay i don't have any more questions in the chat right now So we've been going for one and a half hour, so we're probably going to round up soon. So if people have more questions, please put them in the chat. I don't know if Tish Quirk is listening, but we put her adorable new foal in here. We got that mm -hmm. picture today. I think she's gone. Just, Where'd she go? Just I saw her earlier. <laughs> yeah, she, she was is. here. Oh, there, there she you is. Go. She's, did I'm you here. recognize her, Tish? I certainly did. <laughs> she's so cute, we couldn't stand it. <laughs> she's she's pretty spectacular. And did you read the bottom note on that? We did. We did. That was fascinating. Yeah, you that know, is a story. Every birth is a miracle, but this one, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe what all you went through. Her mother is interesting. You know, all the best, you know, multiple generations of my stallions. And uh, her mother is interesting in that her full brother, they're Danish, her full brother uh, was the hunter superstar when they first started the international hunter derbies. He, uh, he won every one of them, including the $100,000 finals. Oh, wow. And then he really was ready to retire at that point. But Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. for almost a million dollars. And and this is this is the full sister. Oh wow. She's well, pretty cute. Drew pulled up that email and I was like, I had a different full picture in here. I was like, send me that right now. <laughs> She's so cute. She's really cute. Please everybody send me your full pictures because we just love to squish their little faces yeah. through the screen. We're, we love them all. <laughs> Well, I love sending them to you. I will send you more. Okay, appreciate it. She's not named. But yeah, I was wondering. Ask. I was like, I wonder if she'll be on here tonight. Oh, she's not. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I've been here the whole time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and back in the olden days, I hosted the second biggest curing in the country. And I, on the EBOP stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I still have Inietta. She is 32. Uh, oh my gosh. And she was the top star mare in North America and scored the highest EBOP in North oh, America. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, so, you, know, you know what you're doing. So I'm impressed that you came to be with us tonight. <laughs> if her name isn't Simply the Best. I know. You really, really need I'm to just name her. call her Simply the Best anyway. <laughs> well, I think that's what the. Um, I don't own the foal. This was a, oh, okay. uh, an arrangement with the farm owners. And anyway, um, I'm still feel, but that's the name they're leaning toward. And I'm suggesting yeah. that'll they be do the third them. one I've named this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, third, simply the best. No, no. she keeps, she likes to help people name their foals and she's good <laughs> at it. <laughs> 
I helped Wim name one and he said any others that I helped him name I had to pay for so well <laughs> not <doing that> anymore <laughs> I, haven't, I had a simply the best but it was I think 22 years ago it has died oh, yeah. wow. and it, and it well it was died by best of luck oh wow and, cool you know I try to keep the names since I don't use farm initials or anything I try to get people to put names that key to the bloodline, you know, to the family. So I think we're leaning towards simply the best. Perfect. And her barn name might be sister because only the best is right there in the same farm. Oh, cool. And he won, he won everything at the only show he's ever been to. He was, he won absolutely everything that was offered. That's awesome. So I'm not as good as I used to be, but I'm still breeding. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tish. Uh, okay. Kelly, I, I'm glad you like the picture. I'll send more. Please Thank do. You. Thanks, Tish. Thanks, Thanks. Tish. Um, uh, Kelly and Dora, I have another question in the chat. Okay. So I'm going to ask, how long is the DOC taken to process? Um, six to eight weeks is usually the average, um, you know, it, it can take a little bit longer. It kind of, I think they, they run the test in batches. And when we get the samples over there to them, I think it kind of depends on where it lands and where they are with running, running the batches. Um, some, some take longer than others. Um, but it, it's pretty much every bit of six to eight weeks. It's not anything that's ever going to get uh, rushed. <laughs> There's no expediting it, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? This is your chance. Yep. You can always call the office. Of We're course. Happy to help, but hopefully, we <laughs> cleared up some for some people. Yeah, you can always call us or, or text us or message us or yep. it's all fine. I will say, I feel like Drew and I are on the phone just about all day now mm -hmm. and um, I feel terrible. I'll be on a call and I can hear the phone ring and can't get to it. It's just phones, calls are really picking up. We do the best we can to get back to everybody. Um, I've got quite a few voicemails to return tomorrow, but um but we are always happy to help and do as best we can. Yes, of course, you always do that. You do a great job, guys. And thank you so much for this. And we'll do another webinar soon on uh, more KLP and NA topics. Yes. We'll think I think of we something. never did get back to like transferring. We never did, did that one, did we? I, I, I think we think had so. another. Uh, video that we were going to do i can't remember what it was but let us we'll know think what of topics something. you'd like right yeah. absolutely yeah. if there's something you think that needs a good solid conversation with us to be covered we would let us know and we'll try to get one another one done whether it's a webinar or a video like we did for the registration yeah for sure and um it's if you're on facebook it's uh it's um advisable to go on the KLPN and a breeders and owners group because there's tons of people on there that are super experienced and they can give you tons of tips and drew and kelly and myself and megan and all the board people are also in that group so and and hosts of the occurring locations are in that group so everybody can help you there so feel free to post questions in that group absolutely and we love seeing your full pictures in the KLPNNA Fools and Yearlings group too. So you spam along yes. there. We yes. see them all. <laughs> and we, we, we really love screen. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have all old retired horses. So seeing the fuzzy babies makes yeah. me so happy. <laughs> okay. I think we're going to round up ladies. All right. Thanks everybody. We really appreciate you joining in us tonight. And we'll hope to, we hope to see you at the curing. Yes. Get your entries in. Yes, yep. early. Yeah, please. Because <laughs> what was the deadline again, Kelly and Drew? I feel like it's October 31st. August. I mean, I'm August. Sorry, God. <laughs> <laughs> you would be very late if you sent it in on Halloween. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> August 31st. And then I haven't really set a 
strict date, but obviously the October um, Currings, I will accept entries a little bit later than that. But for the first half of the tour there at the end of September, um, August 31st, and then we'll accept late entries uh, with the host permission, I believe through September 12th. Um, but again, just like I said earlier on, make, you may not have a bridal number, you may not have a score sheet. Um, your ribbon might come, your in, ribbon the might come in the mail, <laughs> but um, as long as the host feels that they have room for it. Um, but it, like I said, it, it, it throws off the schedules that we've already made. It just kind of is, is difficult, but that's why we tack on that penalty with the late entries. But, um, and again, this year we're, we're not sure. I mean, we feel like we probably will have larger occurrings than usual, but you really just never know. Um, but you still get, get your entries in. It's, it's appreciated. Appreciate and the fools yeah. need Appreciate to be, <laughs> yeah, the fools need to be 30 days at the curing, right? But um, Correct. You, you advise everyone, even though the fools are not born yet, if they're going to be at least 30 days at the curing date you want to go to, already yes. sign them up now, yes. right? There's Although they're not form. even born yet. Yeah, right. you wouldn't be able to register them through the portal, obviously, but you, the paper form is on the website under forms and currings. Um, I said 2022 in the dam's name and um, we'll get you in there and I did put on there um, if for any reason the foal is unable to be presented we'll issue refunds up until the cutoff date um, and if there happens to be a wait list for that particular site we would bump up another horse um, but we'd rather have your entry and have you scratch then yeah. get a late entry and it's a lot easier for us to scratch a horse than it is to add a late entry yeah so everybody who wants to go to Goering sign up now <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well I'm gonna uh, stop the recording and uh say good night to everyone all right all right thanks everybody Thank really you. appreciate it